Hello, this is Olivet Seminary and a special course on Biblical Personal Ethics. And this is the second lecture. This is the lecture on experiencing the living Lord's guidance in our lives. And I'm privileged to take this time to awaken you to uh, the relationship of God's presence and God's guidance to making great decisions and following biblical ethics, therefore, in uh, real life, not just in our hope for or imaginative uh, way of thinking, but in our real decisions on earth 24-7, any day of the week. Now, we talked about uh, in the first lecture uh, the importance of uh, being awake and vigilant and uh, in this lecture, we're talking about experiencing God's guidance to really uh, know God's guidance through the scriptures, through the spirit, and through our experiences in God's amazing world. Now, the Bible is amazing. It has, is the most precious source of light and guidance and wisdom for our lives. One very powerful verse that uh, was taught in our family uh, by my Christian parents was taught frequently and there was even a plaque on the wall right next to uh, the door that said trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding seek God's will with all that you do and he will show you the right path to take that's an amazing important bit of God's wisdom and guidance to remind us always to trust in the Lord and always to seek and receive his amazing guidance. In the middle of Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he says something that is also hugely memorable. Seek God's kingdom and God's gift of righteousness above all else. And then all these other things will be added to you. Now, God's kingdom is not some country that you could, you could see on a world map, uh, colored in whatever, green or purple. No, it's God's authority wherever we are. God's kingdom is over the whole earth. And the importance of uh, seeking his authority above all else is the recognition that wherever we are, this, the government authorities, of course, matter. And our responsibilities are to cooperate unless there's a contradiction between what they guide us to do and what the Lord himself guides us to do. But wherever we are, we are part of God's kingdom, too, because his authority applies all over his earth. He owns the earth. He created the earth. And, and because he saved us, because he's liberated us, we have this joyful responsibility of walking with God uh, wherever we are. Because the living God is the only almighty creator and redeemer, then God's guidance is always the primary guidance for our lives. <clears throat> so we should do Bible study and prayer really help our minds, our hearts, our souls, our bodies to be in tune with, uh, with the will of God and the guidance of God in our daily lives. At the same time, because God is sovereign, because he is in charge, because he is always present, he sometimes communicates with us in addition through experiences, through relationships, through teachers, through pastors, through our parents, through our friends, even events and opportunities and experiences and achievements can help awaken us and guide us. And, and as we seek God's wisdom, uh, there's a, a integration, a kind of merger of God's presence and uh, uh, rough and tumble or uh, joys and successes of daily life that give us uh, guidance. And we really seek the peace of God, the, the, the peace of that relationship with God, the um, calmness, the, the sense of, 
of health and fullness of God's presence, his peace on earth within our lives to, to guide us in each circumstance to be at peace with God wherever we are, even in very hostile circumstances or even very beneficial and supportive circumstances. And I believe it's helpful to bring the two roles together to really think of God's guidance, think of Bible verses, even as we're in a relationship, in a situation at work or school or in our neighborhood or family, uh, so that the basic ideas and principles of the scripture are integrated into the daily experience as well. And there are two important dimensions with our walk with the Lord. We can talk about the, the vertical as well as the horizontal. On the horizontal level, uh, the, the theme is to glorify God. That's used repeatedly in scripture. And literally it means to, to give God praise, to, to make it so that our behavior, when people know that we represent God, so that people will, will know from our behavior that God is good and that God is great. That, that our behavior, our attitudes, our decisions, the things that we talk about, um, even the things that we talk about that are not specifically from the Bible, but making decisions, how we experience life, our vision for the future, whatever we talk about, if it really represents God's saving grace, God's amazing grace, then, then it will enhance God's reputation by people that don't know God or even hate him or deny his existence, that we will help elevate uh, God's reputation by how we live, is to glorify God. And that's on a horizontal level. And then to give God thanks, to worship God by what we do. We make uh, our work with excellence because it's a gift to God. We want the very best to give God whether it's at work for which we're, we're paid and guided by some bosses, or home where we uh, help benefit our families or through friendships or whatever, to be uh, the kind of people that glorify God, that enhance his reputation by our attitudes and actions. At the same time, to uh, have a vertical relationship, to give thanks to God, and to worship him in whatever that we do. And, and these themes are emphasized in Romans chapter 1, uh, Romans 12, uh, 2. Chapter 1, uh, these are the two things that are so crucial. And when they're missing, Paul describes how life can be degraded and uh, detached and dull. Uh, not good things. But uh, in Romans 12, he also really is talking about these two dimensions too. On the vertical, to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God, is, which is reasonable service. It's really to be devoted, to give thoroughly ourselves living as a living sacrifice. Not killing ourselves, not you know, uh, burning ourselves out. No, as living sacrifices that show God's presence and our gift to God. Isn't that amazing to be to have your life being called as a gift to God? And at the same time, as we were saying, glorifying God, enhancing his reputation among other people. They will see the attractiveness of what you're doing. And one powerful image of glorifying God, Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter two that we are the sweet aroma of Christ Jesus to God. So God's a primary audience, but other people can notice that our behavior is a sweet aroma for Jesus. And that's a way of giving thanks and worshiping God and worshiping God and giving thanks in all that we do and enhancing God's reputation all at the same time. So when we think of God, we think of God as imminent, close with us, uh, God with us, but also transcendent. And, and these are not contradictions. It's not like either or, either he's transcendent or imminent. 
For example, God is transcendent in his love. He is the, the powerful expression of love that changes everything. But love requires him to be with us. To be loving is to want to be with the persons that we love. And therefore, uh, God's love is both imminent and transcendent. And similarly, uh, God's saving grace. He, he has to be God to really save us. He's the only one that can forgive us from breaking the, the rules, breaking the uh, principles of God. He wrote the principles. He has the right to forgive us. And, and this is why the, the gospel is so powerful. While the pagan religions say, no, 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 God can only guide you to do the right things, to add up good karma or whatever. But no, God can forgive us because, because he's the one that uh, liberated us. He's the one that wrote the rules in the first place. So he can liberate us. So again, transcendence and imminence uh, go together. He's our liberator. He can guide us with heavenly wisdom because he is both in heaven and on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven because he is imminent on earth and transcendent in heaven. And he empowers us with uh, special divine wisdom because he is with us to empower us and, and yet he is the master of all the universes. And these ideas are, are also part of the Trinity. In Christ, God is with us. In the Holy Spirit, God is within us. And yet the, we think of the Father above us, uh, even though he is also always present. Now, the, this idea of uh, getting our attention is, and uh, having divine wisdom and guidance in our lives is so crucial. And, and God does this throughout the scriptures. So we have some amazing models of this in the Bible itself. So, for example, when God first spoke with our earliest ancestors, he blessed them, he praised them. And, and then he gave them responsibility to be stewards of the earth. So he got their attention, giving them a blessing, and then puts them in a, a very elevated responsibility of being stewards of his earth. In the Ten Commandments, the, the, uh, before God spoke, there was lightning and thunder, uh, fire, uh, trumpets blurring. Surely got people's attention. And in that uh, uh, event, then God spoke. Uh, but God uh, does things sometimes to get our attention. But we ought to, of course, be seeking God all the time uh, anyway. And then the prophets uh, said and did dramatic things and then spoke remarkably uh, uh, great promises and, and prophecies and moral guidance and moral judgment. Uh, but they did things to get people's attention. That's crucial. That's God's way. We can't uh, really give our full attention uh, unless uh, God has drawn our attention and unless we're willing, unless we're uh, eager to, uh, to please our Father in heaven. The whole Testament can be seen as laying out the foundations grabbing our attention with central themes and issues and questions and typologies, patterns, prophecies, promises. And then these are taken to another level in the New Testament so that the attention getting and framing is strong in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and then the fulfilled and completed and uh, uh, raised to the ultimate full level for our sakes in the gospel as uh, delivered through the New Testament. Jesus' life too, the gospels have dramatic beginnings and then the story of Jesus' life. Jesus himself knew how to get people's attention and got your attention and uh, through you can get other people's attention. But the attention for giving redeemed guidance, uh, helpful wisdom and light for the path that makes life meaningful, purposeful, and uh, fulfilling the purposes for which we were created in the first place. 
The epistles in the Bible often start with theological uh, uh, teachings, a spiritual awakening in the early verses, and then at some point there's the word therefore, and then what comes after that are more specific principles, uh, teachings for behavior, you know, ethical instruction. And that transition is clearer in some of the epistles than others. Romans 12, 1 is uh, a transition point that starts with therefore. Ephesians 4, 1, Philippians 2, 1, Colossians 3, 1, first, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 1, rather, 2 Timothy 2, 1, Hebrews 6, 1, 1 Peter 2, 1. These are places where you, you transition from, we got your attention, we got the big picture, now here's what to do. So being awake and attentive always matters. And one of the reasons, too, is that we are created in God's likeness. Our very essence is to be God's image, is to be God's steward on earth, but he also uses the word likeness. And God himself, of course, knows the facts. He loves information on trends and events. And, and he is uh, always being inventive with fresh approaches and so it's the same truth same gospel truth but god is uh gifted at uh, giving that same truth in fresh ways to capture our attention and to uh, draw us to be more and more empowered uh, through god and these are ways these are the ways that we can resemble god to fulfill this amazing role as god's images and God is our loving Father and desires for us to uh, resemble his amazing characteristics in our daily lives. Now, the biggest factor that contributes to failure when it comes to ethics, the biggest factor is people treat the ethical principles and teaching as something abstract, and they don't see the connection between what they learned with the ethical teachings or ethical rules or principles or exemplars, they don't see that connection with something that's right in front of them. Uh, especially vivid kind of example I've seen over and over is people will say, yes, I love my neighbor as myself. I'm following what Jesus taught, following what was also in Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself, uh, huge very important principle, one of Jesus' main commands during his uh, teaching ministry. And uh, yet there are people that hate their neighbors, that despise their neighbors because of the uh, racial identity of their neighbor, neighbors or educational level or economic level. And uh, uh, so it's amazing people will abstractly say, yeah, I love my neighbor, I believe that's good, uh, but at the same time, will do things that are very hateful and uh, uh, very negative toward uh, neighbors in what they say as well. So I find it, it helpful to help explain that, that Jesus didn't put any qualifiers on this. We are to really love our neighbors as ourselves. Um, and, and that's where that paying attention matters it's not just knowing the principles, memorizing the rules, but it's about uh, always being eager to fill them out by our own uh, behavior and, uh, and find ways to avoid uh, this kind of uh, moral numbness that seems to know what's right and wrong, but not recognize it when that opportunity is right there. And that's a good object for prayer as well and meditation. Uh, to take the whole day, for example, uh, whenever we see somebody, think, love your neighbor as yourself, and how Jesus taught that to be all other people. Uh, or, or some other principle, principle of everyone being a child of God. How about use that image as you walk down the street and see other people with different backgrounds, and, and instead of labeling them by their apparent education or wealth or whatever, to instead think child of God. And we will see them differently. And we will be more loving, tolerant,
caring for our fellow human beings when we do that. So uh, the, the Bible provides uh, amazing resources for our lives. And we need to really take the time to grow in God through the Bible, through the time of prayer, and really engaging Bible verses in prayer, engaging in prayer as we're reading the Bible, um, integrate those, and then uh, use opportunities to encourage one another um, in, in, as we're discipling ourselves to be better followers of Jesus, to encourage one another in their growth, especially new believers, and also children our own children, neighbor children, grandchildren, uh, nephews, nieces. There are ways that we can be an influence for God. And, and that's the role of, of uh, understanding biblical ethics, both for ourselves and for the opportunities we have as influencers for others. So uh, biblical perception and action really matters to nurture with others nurture in others, and including in ourselves, uh, and always continuing to grow uh, within ourselves. And what's helpful for that? Um, reading case studies, reading the Bible as a book of case studies of people learning to walk with God, role-playing, living out a biblical story, a role-playing a story of a, a great uh, a godly person, and, and having a group uh, role play, even spontaneous role play. It doesn't have to be something that's written up, though it could be. Read or listen to people's testimonies of God's work in their lives. Read biographies of people that walk with God, uh, church history. Meditate on uh, Bible passages uh, throughout our daily lives. There's so many different ways that we can become more and more attentive to the presence of God and his amazing, precious guidance in our lives, in our daily lives. So always remember Jesus' final commandment, which includes these words. Teach these new disciples. Could be new followers of Christ or, or children or other people that are being influenced by Christ. Teach them to be vigilant with all the commands that I've given to you. And look and listen to. I am with you every day till the end of the age. So be vigilant. Look and listen. And do it for yourself. Do it for Jesus. Thank you. God bless.